Over the last month, I've noticed three connected problems associated with the current pandemic that are particularly troublesome. Food security problems for tens of millions of Americans, processors shutting down due to outbreaks, and farmers destroying crops and livestock because they can neither sell their product nor keep it. Gee, I wish that we had a government department whose primary job was to ensure food safety and security, regulate food processing, and help farmers in crisis. Oh yeah, we do. These problems all fall under the purview of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The question is, can the USDA solve these problems with a new program? I believe that they can. Back in mid-April, they announced the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, and I have some roasted opinions on the subject. The USDA has a budget of around $120 billion. With that money, they manage all sorts of programs. The Agricultural Risk Program and the Price Loss Coverage Program help farmers weather price dips on the commodities markets. The Federal Crop Insurance Program helps farmers weather a loss of yield due to natural disasters. And the Commodity Credit Corporation provides a host of protective measures for commodities, including the payment of over $2 billion in commodity payments for feed grains, wheat, rice, cotton, soybeans, and peanuts. That's a lot of money, but it's significantly reduced from 2019 when farmers received over $15 billion in payments. Now, I have no problem with paying farmers to keep their commodity prices stable. What I have a problem with is just paying them a subsidy rather than purchasing the production. Here's why. Crop prices vary based on supply and demand, just like any other commodity. When there is too much supply for the demand, the price drops. If the price drops far enough, then the USDA programs kick in to send payments to the farmers. Notice, however, that I didn't mention the government purchasing crops from farmers who have too much to sell and not enough price to support it. That's because under the current program, the USDA doesn't do that. Instead, they pay farmers the difference between the crop price points set by the USDA and the fair market value of their crops. The structure of this program is designed to avoid encouraging overproduction by farmers. In this crisis, though, the farmers can't help overproduction. Their production was based on what the market could bear before COVID closed down the economy worldwide. They planted and acquired livestock based on what would happen months out, because that's what farmers do, plan for the future, and guess as best they can how much the market will be able to bear of their production. The USDA doesn't just run farm programs, though. They also manage nutritional programs like the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, or SNAP. I'm sure that many of you recognize this program. SNAP is the current name for the old food stamp program. With SNAP benefits, recipients have access to monthly supplements to their grocery budget. SNAP benefits can only be used to purchase groceries, which helps people facing hunger and a limited budget. It also boosts the commodities prices by allowing hungry people to buy more food. SNAP is the single biggest portion of the USDA budget at over $69 billion this year. Another food security measure run by the USDA is the child nutrition programs. Funded at nearly $24 billion, these are the programs which provide food through the schools. 31 million kids per day are fed through the school lunch program, which ensures that kids are able to eat at school by keeping prices for school meals low and further subsidizing those meals to kids from low-income families. Part of this program pays schools and other government entities to purchase a list of products which they can then use to feed the kids and absorb more surplus production, this time from the processors. Then there's WIC, which uses $5.75 billion to provide vouchers to pregnant women, infants, and toddlers. These vouchers can be used to purchase milk, eggs, cheese, butter, and infant formula, which kills two birds with one stone. The recipients get critical nutrition for healthy babies, and the producers of those commodities get to sell more of them. There's also a program called the DOD Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program, which purchases, strangely enough, fruits and vegetables. The food goes to schools to feed kids. With the ongoing crisis, this program is being used to help fill meals for the emergency school lunch program. That's right, folks. The school lunch program is still feeding kids even though they aren't going to school. Go figure. Are you sensing a pattern? Funding can be used to purchase food directly rather than just paying farmers for price declines. 
For the most part, that's how the current programs function. The new program allocates $3 billion for purchasing additional food from farmers. All of the pre-existing programs have also seen an increase in their funding to ensure that people can get food, at least whatever food is delivered to the stores. The third problem is the processors. Here, the USDA falls short of having a fully operational answer to processors not being able to work. Food processing, especially meat processing, often involves workers standing shoulder to shoulder while they work. Social distancing isn't built into the process, and there's a good reason for it. Spreading out the workers increases the amount of area and equipment needed to process the carcasses in a meat packing plant. The USDA requires that all processors, not just meat processors, thoroughly clean their equipment at the end of every shift. In many cases, the equipment has to be cleaned during the shift when the processing workers are on break. The more equipment required to move carcasses between workers, the more cleaning will be involved. Working side by side saves money and keeps the price of meat more affordable. Now, before I'm inundated by people advocating for distributing unprocessed food, let me point out that all food, even organic food, is processed in some manner. Fruits and vegetables are at least washed before being packed. Even salad greens have to be washed to remove E. coli bacteria. There have been outbreaks of botulism food poisoning from E. coli contamination on salad greens before. That may not be what people think about when they think about processing food, but believe me, that is processing food. Processors are faced with two problems, COVID outbreaks in their workers and a lack of markets for their products. The COVID outbreaks are forcing plant closures, especially in the meatpacking industry, not only for cleaning, but also because not enough healthy workers are available to operate the plants. The markets are also limited because of the large decrease in restaurants and other hospitality outlets who purchase fresh food. Without those additional purchases in the hospitality industry, the processors don't have enough product going out to be able to operate their plants at a profit. But why not? After all, people aren't eating less, are they? Well, yes, they are. Or at least they are wasting less food. Restaurants and other hospitality businesses produce a lot more food waste than households, both absolutely and as a percentage of purchased food. They have to because most restaurants have some sort of a build-up process. They prepare some foods in advance because making it from scratch to order would take too long. And if that prepped food isn't used by a certain time, it has to be thrown out to maintain food safety. In addition, people are watching their food budgets more closely because of the economic downturn. That means less wasted food, and when projected over a nation of about 330 million people, that means a lot less food being purchased from the processors. Somehow we need to keep the processors running at full tilt while also providing food to people who are struggling. We also need to get help to the food processing industry who are facing those stiff challenges I mentioned. More on that later from Sunny Purdue. So let's start with this new program that's supposed to help out farmers. The new program allows the USDA to purchase the food products and send them to processors like Cisco. Those processors will prepare the food and package it in boxes. The drop in food production can be absorbed in this way and the USDA will get more for their money than just farmers who aren't going bankrupt. All of that food will then be sent to food pantries as a government support for people in need during the crisis. That ensures that food pantries have sufficient goods on hand to provide for those who are lining up to get whatever they can and allows the pantries to spend cash donations on non-food items like soap and toilet paper. It will also streamline the process of distribution for the pantries, as they can keep the boxes in a refrigerated truck and hand them out directly to people without having to sort and package the food themselves. That part of the proposal only costs $3 billion. It also doesn't do anything for the farmers who have already lost a lot of money dumping produce, slaughtering and burying livestock, and pouring out milk because they couldn't sell it. The other part of the proposal is $16 billion in emergency relief payments to be distributed by the end of May. This will compensate those farmers for 85% of their price losses between January and mid-April, allowing farmers to make at least something back. Those emergency relief payments will be capped at $125,000 per commodity and $250,000 per individual or corporate entity. That means that there is more protection for small farmers who are closer to financial ruin than big corporate farms. There will be a second round of payments coming out for losses incurred after mid-April at a much reduced rate of compensation. The processors are getting help too. 
Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue has ordered personal protective equipment to send to packing plants on a priority basis. There will still be some diminished capacity due to safety measures and a shortage of workers, but that reduced capacity is projected to be 10 to 15 percent, not 30 percent or more as many other sources projected. The processors will have time to expand their production facilities to prepare for the increased demand as the outbreak fades and the hospitality industry gets back to work, although they may need some assistance in the form of loans to do it. Now, this outbreak won't last forever. People will go to back to work, and the food supply woes will end. When it's over, I plan to drop by Wendy's and have my usual, a triple Baconator with fries, a large chili, a large chocolate frosty, and a large Dr. Pepper. Until life achieves that level of normality, though, this program from the USDA could help us all. How about that? A government program that actually makes sense. 